website accessibility. Can anyone supply me a short definition of what I mean when I talk about accessibility? Okay, that, I like that. The ability to view the web page um, despite uh, circumstances. And that's a, that's a great definition. Um, does anyone want to extend that? Yes. The, the simplicity of it. There, there's actually a couple of terms here that um, sort of you might think they mean the same thing, but they actually have a slightly different shades of meaning. Uh, one of them is usability, and one of them is accessibility. <coughs> usability <coughs> relates to how easy it is to use. All right. and that's related in a way to accessibility, but it really means sort of a different thing. All right, accessibility, the, the ability to access regardless of circumstances. And usually when we talk about accessibility, we're talking about um, circumstances relating to the person that's accessing the website. In other words, making the website work um, regardless of the person's abilities or disabilities. Okay, That's usually what we mean when we talk about accessibility. Um, sort of, I guess, a, a part of usability uh, is cross-browser compatibility. Or maybe that's a third illity that we can have, compatibility. The three illities, usability, accessibility, and compatibility. Usually this means across different equipment, where accessibility relates to the people accessing it. And can people accessing the site, are they blocked in some way because of their abilities or disabilities? And there's things like this in the real world, too, right? Um, what are some of the accommodations that uh, are made, even here on campus, for people with different disabilities? Read aloud. Pardon me? Like read aloud. Okay, R right. That would be an example of, in a classroom. Um, qu uh, some people, uh, they, they have a, a note saying that, they, that the quizzes are read aloud to them instead of taking it written down. What about just the building? What about just the campus building? Disabled parking. All right, there's, there's uh, parking closer. If, if you uh, um, have the, the proper credentials, you can park there, and, and it makes your life a little easier to not have to park way, way in the back. What's another accommodation? Automatic doors. Automatic doors. Um, some of the doors open automatically. Some people have little remotes that they click and they can open the door. Um, other accommodations. Yes. Go ahead. There's signage that you don't speak English. Okay. The signs for people that either don't speak English or maybe have issues reading. Yes. Ramps for wheelchairs. Um, handicapped uh, stalls in the bathroom. Um, elevators. Uh, if you look outside the door, I'm pretty sure um, there's Braille indicating the room number there in case um, you were blind and, and needed to use Braille to, to find your way around. Um, so there's accommodations uh, on campus in the real world um, that are made that make the, the, the website, uh, or the website, uh, the building, uh, I guess that's the problem when you, when you deal with web development all the day. You think everything's a website, but uh, make the building accessible to people with different disabilities. And there's a couple things to note. First of all, most of these things don't get in the way of people that don't have the disabilities. In other words, it's not like, whoa, 
it's a big inconvenience for people that don't have disabilities that there's an elevator on campus, right? It doesn't really bother people that don't need to use it, right? It's there and it's available for people that need to use it, but it's not really a bother for people that, that don't need to use it. In fact, even people that aren't disabled may sometimes have the need to use an elevator. We'll be an example of someone who isn't disabled per se, but might need to use an elevator on a certain day. You're carrying stuff, yeah. Sometimes you got heavy stuff and you don't wanna don't wanna carry it up the stairs. Yes. Too, too lazy, okay. Uh, I'll be a little more generous and say that maybe you're too tired, or uh, or maybe maybe you have an injury that isn't d disabling, but you know you have an injury, you you sprained your ankle or something, where it's a temporary condition where. You'd rather avoid the steps on a given day, all right? Uh, or carrying stuff. Again, those are examples. Um, what about wheelchair ramps? What are other? Uh, what are other? Uh, what are other? What's the other situation where someone might use a wheelchair ramp other than they're in a wheelchair? Yes. Yeah. When you're rolling a dolly, or a lot of people have the, the, the bags that have rollers on them, you know, and they, they roll their things along uh, instead of uh, carrying it. That would be an example of that as well. Um, so that's sort of a principle as far as when you talk about designing for accessibility, all right? Um, that the stuff that you do will benefit with people with disability but for people who don't have disabilities, A, it won't, at least it won't get in their way. And B, sometimes it might actually help them. All right? For example, the Braille outside of the door. Someone that isn't blind is probably never going to access the Braille. All right? But it's not like it interferes with you finding the room. You know, it's not like it's confusing to you or it makes it more difficult for you to find the room. You just ignore it, all right? And it's sort of the same thing with web pages, all right? The things that you do for accessibility on web pages either won't matter to people that don't have that disability or will actually benefit people under certain circumstances even if they don't have the disability, all right? What are some of the abilities that would affect someone's... Uh, what are some of the disabilities that would affect someone's uh, ability to access a web page or a website? Being blind, that's, that's, that's typically the one that people come up with first. That's the most um, obvious one, being that the web is a, a visual medium. So blindness. Now, go ahead. Dyslexia. Dyslexia. Okay. Another good one. Let's back up a second and talk about blindness. How do people that are blind access the web? No idea, right? Yeah, it, it, with a screen reader. Exactly. Uh, I think I alluded to the fact that um, a bunch of summers ago, I worked at, at, at uh, NASA Glenn for a faculty fellowship. And they have a bunch of people that come in. They bring in faculty people. They also bring in students. And, uh, and, and anyone in technology, that's actually a good sort of internship to look for. So um, you might want to start looking for it. I don't know if they still have that program. I imagine they do to some level. But you, know, you, could, you could take a look at that and possibly apply for a summer internship. It's really a, it really was a great experience for me and I think for the students as well. But uh, my office mate was a high school uh, kid that was blind and she accessed the web using what's called a screen reader. And a screen reader effectively narrates a screen to you. And I'm going to try to use the screen reader here. Uh, Windows has built in a screen reader. Now for people that are actually going to use this, um, there are better uh, there are better screen readers available than the one available in Windows. Um, but again, it comes at a cost. You have to pay for it. Um, so we're going to try to access it. And the thing to keep in mind is it's going to seem really difficult. All right? But it's one of those things that if you had to do it, you would do it. 
Now, this high school kid was able to work their way through the web, was able to create PowerPoint presentations, was able to do the things that you would expect a high school kid to be able to do, um, even chat with their friends instead of working. All right? All these things they were able to do um, through the use of the screen reader technology. And this is a characteristic about accessibility, whether you're talking about in the physical world or uh, online, is that there are things called assistive technologies. Screen reader is an example of that. All right? A wheelchair ramp is an example of that. And a, and a wheelchair is an example of assistive technology. All these things are assistive technology. And they work fine as long as the design works with them instead of working against them. So let's try to turn on the screen reader and let's see if we can get a little bit of the experience of what it would be like. All right. Um, first of all, let's find someone that knows Windows 10 very well. There we go. And you'll notice that built into Windows, um, Ease of Access Center. There are a number of things. For one thing, there is a, a magnifier to magnify part of the screen. So if you really have bad vision, you can do this. You can magnify the screen. There's an on-screen keyboard for people that can't type. I had a student that um, I'm not sure what, they, what condition they had. Um, they may have had um, MS or, or some other condition where they were not really able to um, type on a regular keyboard. So they use the on-screen keyboard. Let me try to get, uh, you know, like this. So if I, if I went into uh, some place I need to type, I would use the on-screen keyboard, similar like what you'd use with a phone, except you can navigate it with the mouse. It would take forever, but what's the alternative to not use it at all, right? It's just like people that, um, the other thing that I noticed, just even the person, uh, the high school students that I was with in NASA, um, just finding their way around campus, that was hard enough for me that can see, right? Because it's a big campus, uh, NASA Glen. Um, and, and just to find your way around and, and find the right building and all that, that's a challenge. But again, you do what you have to do. So if that's the only way to navigate is with a white cane and following the braille and things like that, you, you get it done. Um, other things... that we will briefly explore is the narrator. Let me... 83, 100. Okay, so to imagine this... Tool tip. Ideally, Firefox. you should close your eyes, right? Because you can't see the screen to do this. And actually, I should disable the mouse if I wanted to simulate the experience for myself, right? Because people that are blind can't use the mouse, right? They can only use the keyboard. You know, people type without seeing the keys, right? Um, so blind people can do that. Um, in addition to using the mouse to type, being able to use a keyboard to type and using keyboard shortcuts is another aspect of accessibility. But let's go into a web page. Tooltip, Google Chrome, untitled. Internet Usage Policy Lorain County Community College, Real Education Real Jobs A Real Future, Lorain County Community College, Real Education Real Jobs A Real Future, T Lorain County Community College, Real Education Lorain County Community College, Real Education AZ Index, L Faculty Slash Staff, Canvas, Link my campus link tab tab search button tab. getting started link student resources link 
programs and careers. What I'm doing is I'm hitting the tab key. Value and that's taking me from slash link. I found something I was interested programs, in. Campus life, student life, link, space. Value HTTPS colon slash space. Clubs and organizations. Link. I thought I'd hit space by thinking Value hit HTT enter. enter. Clubs and organizations. Page. Student life. Clubs and organizations. Student life. T desktop one. Skip to content. Link. Value H and clubs and organizations. Student life. Clubs and organization, campus life, student life, student life home, all campus picnic, link. All campus picnic, faculty and staff, desktop one, Lorraine count AZ index, link. Now I'm not terribly familiar with this, so I don't know all the ways to navigate. All camp Bridget host window. I know the basic Game. ones. Ease of access center, start narrator button, Bridget host window, narrator settings, press exiting narrator. Okay, I know the basic ones of using the tab to navigate from link to link, using the uh, enter to, to follow a link. There's other keyboard commands that you can learn. So with a short trading session, um, someone would be able to navigate that. Um, notice a couple things. Uh, one thing is when I were, went into the search box, nothing was said. That would be confusing. I would have no idea where I was. All right. So even with this assistive technology, if the web page isn't designed correctly, um, it's possible to defeat that assistive technology. It would be like people can have all the wheelchairs in the world, but if the doors are too narrow for the wheelchair to get into, then they don't really do any good as far as accessing a particular room, or if there are no ramps on campus or elevators or something like that. So design and assistive technology go hand in hand. Users could have assistive technology to help them. We saw a couple examples right there. The on-screen keyboard, the magnifier, um, the, um, the um, uh, screen narrator, all examples of assistive technology. But the design is really what we're focused in on because we want to make sure that our design works with the assistive technology and doesn't work against it. All right, let's go back to blind, all right? Blindness is certainly one condition that would definitely affect your ability to uh, access the web. What are some other vision-related conditions that would, that would affect your ability to access the web? Not blindness, but related to vision. Colorblind. Colorblind. What can you do design-wise? to help someone that's colorblind. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh-huh. Correct. Okay. That that's a that's an excellent point. Uh first of all, I, I we use the word colorblind. It's not one thing. It's not like colorblind people see in black and white. All right, there's different kinds of colorblindness. Uh, being able to distinguish red and green is one form of colorblindness. And there's a whole bunch of other forms of colorblindness. One thing that you can do is you can use very high contrasting colors. All right, regardless of colorblindness, you know, white background, black text is going to be visible. All right, no matter how colorblind someone is. All right. So that's why I, I sometimes say, you know what, if you don't have a better idea, go with that, all right? But there are other contrasting color schemes that can work as well. So make sure you pick a high contrast color scheme. Don't do things like put a red text on an orange background, all right? For one thing, that would be hard for anyone to read, let alone someone that is colorblind. It may literally be impossible. The other thing that you can do is if you use color to indicate some sort of meaning, use something else in addition to color. So for example, let's say I'm a prescription drug company and I have a list of side effects of my medication. Don't you hate hearing those side effects like on the TV commercials? It's like, oh my God, that's worse than the thing I'm getting the prescription for, you know? But anyhow, you see, uh, you might want to put that in red on your web page to make it stand out, all right? Um, 
or warnings or things like that. Well, if someone can't distinguish red, it's not going to really stand out for them. So what you could do is you could use red in combination with something else. You could use red and have a border around it. That will make it stand out a little bit. Or you can make it red and have a bigger font or bold font or italics or something like that. So if you're using something for people that are colorblind, uh, in addition to making sure you select a good contrasting color schemes, scheme, use color along with other things to show meaning. All right, so don't just show something in a different color to emphasize it. Show in a different color and change the font. Put a border around it, do something like that. There's actually a web page out there that shows you can look at your web page and see what it would look like for different people with different kinds of color blindness. This takes a little while to run sometimes. Here's an ex well, here's an example of a picture. Now, are those crayons? Okay. We can look if you have red, red weak. That's what it would look like. Green weak. Blue weak. This gives you an idea of what a picture would look like so that you can understand the kind of color blindness people can have. You can also go and put in an image or upload an image or I've also seen versions where you can actually put a URL out there. So one thing you could do, for example, if you want to see what your website looked like for people with color blindness, is take a screenshot of it. All right? Actually, let's, well, we won't do that. But you could go and take a screenshot, get a picture from it, and then upload the picture, and it will show you what your color scheme would look like. There's also ones where you can actually put in a URL, and it will show you what it looks like. All right, like there's an example page that would be look like uh, if you did not have color blindness, and there is with a certain kinds of color blindness. We could go to any page if we want to. Let's go to lorraineccc.edu, and we can choose what color blindness that we want to filter for. This might take a while, so I might let it run in the background. Try not to get hypnotized by those things going around. All right, there's a normal website. And that's what it looked like if you had that color blindness. Notice there's no real difference. The only difference, and it might be a little hard to see on the screen, is this box. Uh, in the colorblind version, you can see on the monitor, you might not be able to see up there, it kind of is pinkish, uh, where it's grayish over on here. But you know what? Again, it doesn't look identical, but at least it looks okay. There's nothing that I can't read on this based on uh, the color scheme. So, now another thing, the answer that I like with the, that you gave is give people a choice of colors, right? Now, many websites do that, and it's kind of cool that you can pick your favorite colors. I think Canvas even does that, right, where you can pick the color scheme that you like. And this is great. I'd rather see colors that I like than ugly colors, right? So it's kind of cool for people that don't have color blindness, but for people that are color blind, that can become critical because they can pick the color scheme that works best for them and that causes them the least trouble, 
So they, uh, by doing that, again, they, they have the advantage of customizing it the way that, that they want, um, and uh, it will help them um, be able to access the site better. What are other examples, other than colorblindness, of vision-related issues? OK, that's not really a vision-related issue. Uh, there are, and, and we'll put it down because we want to come back to that. And I see what you're saying, like, like sometimes animations can trigger seizures. Um, that's a great point. I won't really classify that as a vision related, but we will want to address that um, in a bit. Uh, what about vision related issues? Okay, so you're not blind, you're not colorblind, but what other vision related issues can you have? Sensitive to light, all right. Um, strong colors. Um, that's a possibility. Um, one thing you could always do with that is you could adjust your monitor to, to, to dim the colors a little bit. Um, that, I, I've never, not thought of that one. That could possibly be an issue, uh, in which case maybe subdued colors instead of harsh colors. So maybe instead of white and black, use white and gray or different shades of gray, all right, possibly. Um, This one might be so simple that we're, we're not thinking of it, all right? What about people that just don't have good vision, all right? I'm not blind, all right? I'm not colorblind. My eyes are just horrible, right? And even with glasses and with bifocals, my eyes aren't that good, all right? So therefore, um, sometimes, and again, this is one of those things that unfortunately happen as you get older. They're not getting better, all right? Although, actually, I've heard if I ever have cataracts, my vision will actually improve, believe it or not, provided they don't mess up the surgery. Because <laughs> apparently, when, when you have cataracts, they like, I don't know, it's kind of gross, but they scrape your eye to remove them. And then when they do that, they sort of reshape your eyes, and you might actually have better vision. So at any rate, for the most part, your eyes don't get better, all right? They, they get a little worse, a little worse, and so on. Um, so just bad eye, bad vision. All right, that's one. And what can you do for that? Well, make your text readable. Put white space in there. Don't have a giant block of, of text. Put some space between things. Use a large enough font. Use good color schemes, and so on. Now, a couple of interesting points I want to make from this before we go on to the other disabilities. First of all, a lot of times people think that website accessibility and building websites for people that are disabled, that accommodate people that are disabled, really is doing a lot of work for a relatively few number of people. That's not true. All right, that's not true. Because for every major disability, there are milder forms of it that also affect the person's experience. And that's an important thing to remember. So when we talk about people that are visually impaired, we're not just talking about people that are totally blind. We're talking about people that are blind. We're talking about people that are colorblind. And we're talking about people that simply have bad vision. All right? We want our sites to accommodate all those people. So certain population of the country or the world is blind. When you add on to that people that are colorblind, when you add on to that people that have poor vision, you're now talking about a much greater number. All right? Um, we can look at accessibility either from the perspective of we're doing it because we want to be good, we want to be good web citizens and accommodate everyone, or we can look at it from the perspective that we want everyone to be able to access our site to use our organization to purchase from our organization. If you think about it, if you're blind, all right, going out of the house is very difficult for you. Right? It's more difficult probably than for people that are able to see. You can't drive yourself and so on. Doesn't it make sense then that people that are blind might want to participate in online shopping? Absolutely. So from a selfish viewpoint, you can say, well, yes, we want to be good web citizens. We want our site accessible for everyone because that's the right thing to do. 
But we can also say, well, gee, that's a market that we can possibly sell to. So yeah, there's, there's, the, there's the good part of it, but there's also the selfish part, that we want to promote our organization and get people to use our services, whatever uh, it may be. All right. Um, so there's more people that, that have these conditions that, uh, than, uh, than, than just people that have the most extreme version of the conditions. The other thing is a lot of what we do for people with accessibility is really just plain good web design, right? For example, contrasting colors. You want good contrasting colors regardless of whether you're talking about it from an accessibility perspective or just appealing to everyone, right? Who wants a website that doesn't have good contrast between the background and the text? Who wants a website that the text is too small or that's crammed together um, or whatever, right? So what you do for people with a disability can help people and generally is just good design and it can help people even if they don't have that disability. All right. Let's look at some of the other conditions that we mentioned. Dyslexia. What is dyslexia, by the way? You read things backwards, that's a small part of dyslexia. The letters could be jumbled up, or words can be jumbled up, or letters can be confused. For example, uh, a lowercase b and a lowercase d could be confused. All right. There's actually online a little simulator that can show you All right, how is the dyslexia experience? Letter reversal. D for B, tip for pit, M for W, belt for left, may confuse small words, spelling difficulty. These are all different ways that dyslexia can be experienced. Pardon me? Oh, numbers too, right. So be an example of text that someone with, de uh, uh, someone with uh, dyslexia could see it this way. Let's see if we can read it. Would a text-only site be ideal for someone with a reading disorder? Hardly. Images are not bad for accessibility. They actually increase comprehension and usability for most I'm, audiences. Thank you. Um, what many people do not know though is there is much more at the accessibility for an image than just its alt text. Some people, what, pardon? Merely, okay. Here is the correct version. Would a text only, some people wrongly assume that the images are bad for accessibility. All right, so that's an example of that, you know. So, um, that was, that's just one example and we can continue to uh, review this and some of the techniques it can use. All right, here are some of the things that help. Consistent navigation schemes. All right, keep navigation schemes as consistent as possible. Users are actually to predict where a button can be, you'll have a better experience with your website. Now, uh, I think I mentioned this before, there's uh, Jacob Nielsen, a famous uh, usability expert, has something called Nielsen's Law, where he says that people spend more time on other websites than your website, all right? Therefore, do things in a standard way, all right? Navigation is typically in a standard position, 
All right? So navigation typically is on the top of the page. Uh, or it can be on the side of the page. Now you might think, well, I'm going to be creative and I'm going to put it somewhere else on the page. Well, there's opportunities in web, uh, web design to be creative, there's the, and there's opportunities for you to sort of go with convention to make your site more usable. All right. Other things, for example, the search button. Most search buttons are located up here on the screen. So you could put your search button and search box and button somewhere else, but that's going to make it harder for people to find it. Here's some other things. Organize information in manageable chunks. Individuals with cognitive disabilities may have difficulty focusing on or comprehending lengthy sections of text. Therefore, group textual information under logical headings. So have things broken down on your page. You know who else doesn't like to read giant blocks of text on web pages? Nearly everyone else on earth, right? All right. You typically accessing the web and reading from a web page isn't like reading a book. All right, it is more like you're scan. You know, oftentimes you're scanning the page. You're looking for what you're interested in. If you are, for example, looking for uh, information about when the library is open, for example, if you go to the library's homepage, you're not interested in reading about the history of the library and and uh, how many branches they have, and so on and so forth. You just want to get to the piece of information you're interested for. So if you organize a page into small chunks of that, you're going to help people with dyslexia, uh, at least according to this, this expert. But you know what? You're going to help everyone else as well. All right. So therefore, think in those sorts of terms. Give your content a context. All right. So, for example, this, <laughs> I, this is probably the absolute worst example, although maybe it's the best example. They use, they use locations in Wales, which is like really hard for people to read anyhow. Uh, these aren't jumbled words, all right? These are the actual words. But notice what they did. They gave directions along with a map. That puts it in context. So we think of images as making our pages look nicer and making them more appealing visually. But images actually provide information. So this map helps put in context. So hopefully someone from this area that would see this would look and the image would help them understand the directions. All right? Because they could see the different places uh, that uh, they're going to. Having a printable version of the page. Allow users to control things. So things like this. Uh, well, we won't talk about that. And additional resources. So again, people with dyslexia, um, what you can do to help them is going to help other people as well by logically organizing your page into small chunks, by using images to create context, and by keeping things simple. Also, font selection it can be very critical. There, there's a lot of debate and there's a lot of studies that talk about uh, what sort of fonts help uh, people that are dyslexic. Yes. Is it, all, is it fair to say it's all done through CSS? Uh, I, I hate to say all, but yeah, a good part of it. Because remember, that's what CSS is responsible for, it's for the appearance of the page. Um, but not exclusively. For example, you're going to put an image in HTML. And we're going to talk about some of these things too. So I guess if you're talking about visual things, yes, it's going to be through CSS. But there are some examples of uh, things we haven't talked about hearing yet, but there's like extra content that you might put on a page, and that would be in HTML. So clear fonts, organization, small chunks, and 
and images. Epilepsy. Uh, what's the issue relating to epilepsy? Flashing pictures, flashing animations can trigger that. So what do you do? Don't use them. All right. That's one alternative. Because I'll tell you what, especially on the early days of the web, people used them because they were fun to make and they're fun to put on. But guess what? They don't really add any content. They don't really add any extra meaning or any, under, any understanding. And I'm sure all of you, uh, when you uh, had to look up poorly designed web pages, you probably found a few with flashing graphics and all these kinds of things, right? Now, what if you had an animation that actually was useful on your site? An animation, let's say, that explains something on, on, on your web, uh, about your content. For example, you could have an animation about, um, let's say where the, it was a biology class, all right? And there was an animation that showed how cells divide, all right? Does that mean never using animations? No. What could you do instead? You could make them the right speed. You could make sure that they're not the sort that trigger that. That's one possibility. Use a softer color scheme. Again, avoid the strong flashing. I'm not really an expert in this area, but those are reasonable suggestions. Have a click to play. Warn the user. The following is an animation. All right. Does that mean then that someone that didn't want to view the animation would have no other options? What could you do instead then for someone Let's say we've done all that we could and we warn the user that says, hey, if you click this link, you're going to see an animation. What could we do for people that did not want to see the animation for whatever reason? Yeah, show an alternative way. Show a series of individual images. All right? So. Flashing animations. So how can we do that? One, avoid if just decoration. If not decoration, warn and provide an alternative. Now, we're not done talking about all the different, uh, all the different uh, disabilities and what we can do to accommodate them, but we're at a good point to talk about the notion of what's called universal design. The idea of universal design goes like this. We're not developing pages for people with disabilities or we're developing people, uh, pages for people without disabilities. We're developing web pages that help everyone. We're, concerning, we're considering everyone as part of our audience. We're not just doing it for people with disabilities. We're not just doing it for people without disabilities. We're trying to develop for everyone. Because we've noticed a couple of things, all right? Number one, a lot of design for accessibility is just plain good design, period, that's going to benefit everyone. Having good contrast, having white space, dividing things into sections, those are things that benefit everyone. They're just good plain design. All right? Number two, some of the accessibility things that we'll consider, and we'll consider more of them, for example, with hearing. Let's talk about hearing now. Hearing, again, people can't hear stuff. What can you do um, if someone, uh, if you have a video on your page? And, and, and how can you make that accessible for people that have hearing difficulties? Subtitles, absolutely. What will be another option for subtitles? You could have a sign language person. 
Have you ever seen, by the way, some of my favorite videos on the web is I've seen rappers uh, where they have had a sign language interpreter interpreting uh, the, the, the stuff along with them. That is amazing. In fact, forget what we we're talking about. We've got to view this. Okay, I apologize now for any bad language uh, that would be here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I deliberately am waiting on this, so I picked the right one. But anyhow, here we go. Sign language interpreter at a Snoop Dogg concert. in which you're moving your body or tilting your body conveys a lot of different power dynamics which hip-hop is big about right, I've always loved hip-hop I've always been really intrigued with that the whole idea of being able to use words to convey multiple meanings and then becoming an interpreter you know obviously was kind of a natural marriage there but well, let's look at this one a silent I want to introduce rap you battle. to three very talented women great I'll leave it to you guys Holly Stone still getting on my schedule oh no love for me. breaking hearts no keys push to start yeah Okay, I'll stop now before I... <laughs> All right. The point is, the point is, there, always, there usually is a point somewhere in there. All right? And I hope we don't lose it. The point is, is that what you can do is you can provide an alternate way of getting the same information across. Now, sometimes that alternate way can be useful to even people that don't have that disabilities. For example, what if you're in the computer lab and you're watching a video? There's no speakers in the computer lab, all right? Unless you happen to bring headphones, you can't hear any audio. So think of being in any public place, all right, that you're watching a video, the library, the computer lab, whatever. If you don't have headphones, they frown upon turning the speaker up, or there might not even be speakers. So a caption would help you in that situation, all right? Caption would also help you if you don't have great hearing. All right. So one thing that we're always going to come back to is older people don't necessarily have any of these disabilities, but definitely as you get older, you start experiencing problems with your vision, with your hearing, and so on. So I sometimes, if it's hard for me to hear something, I'll turn on the captions and watch it along there. Another example would be a transcript. So a caption is similar. A caption would flash up as the video is playing. A transcript would be just like the whole thing printed all at once. That's useful if you just want to skim it. For example, if I see a news story uh, somewhere, if there's a transcript of it, I'll read through it to see if I want to watch the video. All right. So it can be beneficial to people even that don't have that disability. All right. So universal design. The two main aspects of this, and we'll pick this up again on Wednesday, are simplicity. Keep it simple. How many people complain, complain that they went to a website and it was too easy to use? You don't hear that complaint, right? In fact, most of the time when people complain, it's just the opposite. It's too difficult to use. It's too much stuff in it. I can't find what I wanted. So making your site simple is good. We talked about it from the perspective of, of, of dyslexia. We talked about it from uh, the perspective of uh, epilepsy. For all these things, simplicity is important. Second thing is multiple presentations.
show the same content two different ways. So we have text about something, we also have an image about that. That helps people easily put the text in context so that they can understand um, what's, what's being talked about. If there's, if there's something audio, have captions or have a transcript of it. So take the same information, put it two different ways. And we'll find that will benefit not just people with a certain disabilities, but it will also benefit people, even people that don't have those disabilities. Okay, we'll pick up on this next time and wrap this up. We'll probably spend part of the class on this, and then we'll get into our next topic. All right, see you in lab.